This is Slashers, your new favorite podcast about your new favorite horror media. My name is Jake, and with me, as always, are my established, my esteemed, not my established, but it is established that you're my esteemed colleagues, co-hosts, and cohorts, Adrian and Doug. Gang, say hello to the mutant goons from beyond. Hey, all you mutant goons from beyond. I am esteemed. I'm esteemed carrot, esteemed waxing carrot. Uh, you know, I'm sure you guys missed that the past two weeks, right? Good. Oh, yeah, we missed it a lot. Actually, yeah, none of us say that except for Doug. That's so funny. It's his little saying. Um, oh, hey, guys, it's Aid. How y'all doing? Well, my two co-hosts, and I hope everyone at home is doing fantastic because it's October. She says with a glass of wine white knuckle clutched in her hand because Halloween can't come close enough. (laughs) Well, yeah, I need wine after my job. So there you go. Okay. So now we've established Doug's catchphrase and Adrian's. I need wine after my job. We'll make a shirt for that. (laughs) Yeah. Well, well, drinking wine after that job is probably a lot better. You you know, I've seen a lot of these uh, middle-aged angry white women with Dolce and Gabbana sunglasses carrying wine and talking with their golden retriever dog saying, come vanity, this is the pretty poor area. You know, so you, you could be one of those ladies. No, you are aid. You're your, you're our own aid. This is great. Yeah. Well, I, oh, we made a live slash love t-shirt with red wine on it. So that's my, that's like, you know, an homage to me or I thought, right? Yeah. Because, thank you. It was us mocking because it was like, I know you're like that type of person, but cool. You know what I mean? You know what I'm talking about? Like yeah. you're like, a balanced diet is the piece of chocolate in each hand. But like you would say, like a balanced diet is a piece of chocolate in one hand and a DVD of Blood Diner in the other. Yeah. And, and a glass of wine in front of me. In one of those beer hats with the or straws. Bottle. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We could put the bottle of wine in the straw and that'd be that. Do you do, do you drink wine out of a, a straw? I, I think it's it's taboo to drink alcohol yeah. through a straw generally because it gets you tipsy faster. Is that my understanding? It it's supposed to. I don't know if that's a myth or not. But Doug, I I don't know if you remember back in the day because J- Dr- Jake does not drink. Um, but whenever we would drink anything out of with a straw, we would always be like wasted earlier. But I don't know if that was like in our heads. Is that scientific? No. Well, uh, here's my opinion on it. It gives you less uh, yellowish teeth. To be honest, but but all idea. that stuff's going straight to your throat. You know what I mean? So it doesn't give your mouth uh, or your savory glands. Uh, I'm I'm starting to sound like PBS here. You know the the amount yeah. of time to like oh this is alcohol, so my, my brain has to process it. No, you just chug it all down. That's why people get drunk off of shotgunning beer. You know. Well, and also oh, yeah, if they don't like the true. taste of alcohol, it gets over the teeth, through the gums, and beyond the tongue, and then they just drink more of it. I'll never forget. I was at a house party one time, and they thought it would be funny to give the straight edge guy Jello shots because like. We made two kinds, okay? There's some with alcohol and some without. So we'll see all the people who are posers. And I was like, okay, but the Jello is still not vegan, so I'm still not going mm. to eat them. And it, like, it was a thing. That's all I remember from that night because it just kept coming up. And I was like, I don't understand how this is so important to you. Well, I think it's if you're at a party that you, people are drinking at, like, you know, you're expected to drink, like. I mean, if you're at an 8 a meeting, then obviously you're not, you know, nobody expects to. You. But you are expected to drink the shitty coffee. If you've ever gone to an AA meeting, which I have before, don't ask me why. But not because I have a problem, but because I got caught drinking on campus underage. It was the whole thing. The Anyways. first step to a, a recovery is admitting you have a problem. We just mentioned your white knuckle clutched wine. You realize this. <laughs> 20 anyways so i had to go and listen to these horrible stories and like everybody literally has the worst story it's like oh my god did you write it like a memoir like you did all of these horrible things then my yeah. grandma was attacked in a sh- 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 uh, car accident yeah. slash shark attack and then my house was set on fire but i'm here and i'm not an alcoholic anymore you know, know, and the thing is, I'm not allowed to go to AA meetings. Um, yeah, my mom took me to one of them. <laughs> my mom took me to one of them. Sorry. Who declared this? <laughs> the, 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 the AA Sultan meeting. The, of AA? the ones that the, the uh, well, basically what happened was they got mad at me and they're like, you know, he's not welcome back anymore. All I did, and I didn't know I was being rude. I went there and everyone's like, hello, my name's uh, so-and-so. I'm an alcoholic. Hello, my name's Terry. I'm an alcoholic. And I went, hi, my name's Doug. I'm not an alcoholic, just so everyone knows. Oh. And everyone got mad at me. They had their hands on their hips, like, what, what does he think they're better than? So. I legitimately thought you were going to say, I, my name is Chicka Chicka Slim Shady, but it's okay. 
That would have been a lot cooler. I think they would have got the reference. Yeah, more. they shouldn't have judged you for that because you're allowed to go. Anyone's allowed to go. Like, you're allowed to go if you need, if you're there in support of somebody. So, like, you don't have to share a bad story. I didn't have a bad story. I just got caught drinking at the tailgate at college and I got in trouble. That's a bad story. <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, yeah, you, but- your bad stories would have made people laugh. I think, you know, I was dying laughing. So was your hire for 20 minutes with your whole thing. It's like, so what is a life worth to you? <laughs> if, if a gun was on Dan's head, <gasps> oh my I'm God. sorry, I'll give you me. I just imagine you like crying and like taking off your <laughs> clothes slowly. And I'm like, wow, I was this went so, dark. <laughs> I will never forgive you, Jake, for that. I'm still upset over that. How is it my fault? You're the one who went to like the deepest like let's take because you said you're being serious and you got really like quiet like you're yeah because like i'm this. a fucking idiot and mm. you've listened to every episode of the show and been on fucking half of them have i ever been serious in the entirety of the show well for once i was just i you know i was taking it at face value i wasn't drinking wine that day so <laughs> drinking maybe something that's way why. harder <laughs> fucking varnish or something am i right no i wasn't drinking at all like i don't drink all the time i just had a bad day so here we go okay so anyway. do you want to go through the list of things that you determine if you're an alcoholic because drinking to change your mood is like number one on that list no, it doesn't change my mood. It but just like you were talking about having a bad day and correlating about <sighs> drinking, which means you're kind of planning it out. Which I don't want to tell you how to live your life, but you kind of just admitted that publicly. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, you just come to the AA <laughs> slash intervention of Slashers podcast because I'm just gonna sit here quietly now. No, well, yeah, you just quietly because you're sipping. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the Kermit meme. Yeah. Uh, anyway. As an attorney, I have to do drug and alcohol counseling every time I you know, do my continuing legal education. You know how fucking annoying it is to be the straight edge guy who's never had a, a drink and I'm listening to people who are like, oh, yeah, I killed a family of six and uh, I lost my law license. I had to suck dick and be a homeless person for a few years, but I figured it out and I'm here to warn you of the dangers. I'm like, I know the dangers. I'm addicted to everything, dickhead. That's why I don't do any of it. Hmm. Well, when are they going to have addicted to um, pocket minis? <laughs> yeah. Honestly, like I have my, I so I hacked my 3ds, or, or I, I did not hack my 3ds. It, uh, it just it has other games that are there, and I like my wife was making fun of me the other day because like, oh, you keep downloading all these games, and you don't, you don't even play all of them. It's like an addiction. And I was like, oh, um, actually, if you'd like to look at my save data on each of them, I played each of them. I didn't tell her I only play tested them, but I'm literally having a problem well i just say would you rather me download these games to a rom file or just snort lines of coke right here and then do (laughs) oh i should have brought you so we had an assembly of uh with the kids today about drugs and they gave all the kids a copy of this girl's diary who passed away and she has drawings of people snorting coke across the table but they're very good drawings i'm like oh okay oh wasted potential (laughs) I know. She could have been a comic book artist. Bless her heart. Oh, my God. But, you know, like, I hate seeing things like that and then giving that to the kids because, no, they were not on their phones today. They all had this chick's diary and they were talking about it all day. They were like, there is some tea in here, miss. So naturally, I went and got a copy. Tea is in titties? No, like you spill the tea. Oh, the cheese. The cheese man. The cheese man. Yeah. Well, this is what we say down south. You spill the tea. I when figure that's out of the South or the Queen's English. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, we like totally got off topic here. I'm sorry. We can bring well, it back. What's the point of this month? This is Talktober where, you know, we're a horror podcast all year long. So for us, when it comes to the month of October, cool. Some people might have new interest in the show because they're just in the mood. Uh, but we're doing something a little bit different and breaking from tradition. The show has been very largely structured for a long time. We're still going to have structure in these episodes, But we're going to talk and discuss and theorize and brainstorm and do some just different things instead of just doing a movie review. You know, we've long talked about it. I really think that movie reviews are kind of boring, especially when you do like a point by point analysis of what happens. Uh, So this episode is my Talktober offering, which is reboot versus remake. And I want to talk about a bunch of horror films that, uh, you know, we had originally conceived this as what horror remakes are as good or better than the originals and i got into that list and I'm like this list is kind of boring like these are all kind of well trodden but what's really interesting is looking at the mechanics that make reboots and remakes different 
and where each succeed. Are you guys ready to gape your buttholes and let me spit in them and then penetrate them with my words? Yes, let's open up that spit roast. See, and then Adrian, you look so apprehensive. You, you're sitting there judging me with these church eyes. Come on, play the game. <laughs> yes, play spit in everybody's butthole today, Jake. We can't wait. Spitting rhymes, son, with my <laughs> chicka chicka slim shady hair. Doug, did you ever bleach your hair blonde? Yes, I have, actually. I, I did it for a movie, um, The Maverick and Grundy. When that movie comes out, you'll see me bleach blonde, and I have like 40 pounds added to my neck. <laughs> so. Nice. Aid, yeah. have you ever been a blonde? Yes. Neat. I've been to blonde like three, four times. Like I go blonde usually in the summer. Oh. Yeah. When Didn't you met me, year. I what was blonde. You? I just did highlights this year uh, because it's the only issue with, with being blonde is that uh, it's a lot of upkeep, especially because my hair is so dark. That's yeah. I had the reverse problem when I used to dye my hair black when I was cool and emo and stuff. My roots would grow in like within two weeks and I'd be like, well, this is this is annoying. Yeah. Well, I better start dyeing my hair blonde or white because I'm I'm going on 31. I'm getting gray hair, so I better dye it soon. Oh, shut up, oh, wah, wah. Am yeah. I the oldest one now? We've established that I am, huh? This is bullshit. Jake, Jake you're 87, right? Yep. So I'm, I'm 87 years old. That's correct. Yeah. You don't look a day over 69. Thanks, huh. brother. <laughs> I'm uh, so I was actually watching old. something about Buck Flower the other day, and I thought about Doug. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! What what the the porn stuff or like the stuff in the eighties? Just basically him being the universal hobo, which is great. I mean, imagine like being typecast as the hobo. That'd be awesome. Like, imagine you're in a tuxedo with a top hat. You're walking down you know Hollywood Boulevard, and somebody comes up to you and goes, "Hey, despite this garb, you're a famous hobo, aren't you?" Yeah, That's and it's it's funny. Just imagine walking down like Hollywood Boulevard, and it's like you know we we need a we need a role for a uh, for a for a wife beating stepdad. Oh, let's get Buck Flowers. That, that's really what he is like in a lot of right? movies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So with regard to the thesis for this episode, uh, one rule I want to put in. No public domain bullshit. We're not dealing with it. We're not doing Wolfman, not doing Dracula, not doing Frankenstein. Because yeah. then we'd have to do I, Frankenstein. Not doing Invisible Man because then we'd have to do Hollow Man, which despite me being a Paul Verhoeven fan, not going to do it. And then there's The Mummy, which... I mean, I don't want to have to utter the name Tom Cruise on this show, so let's just move along. Just did. Well, I will admit, Fuckenstein's a pretty good remake. <laughs> or The Repenetrator, that's a good one. Yeah. Mm hmm. So, uh, some of the reboots that I have on the list. Uh, I, do you want me to do the thing where I say it all really quick and then I do the other one real quick and we just go point by point? Okay. See some yeah. more. Make okay. sure you. Tell us which list you're reading from. Well, naturally, tell, it's if you looked at audience. my notes, you would see it at the top it is labeled Reboot and Remake. You have to you guys hear down. a helicopter Wait. flying over. It's the El Monte PD. So just no. heads up. Oh, it's okay because I just had a fire truck drive by me. So Jesus Christ. D Doug and I live in the ghetto. <laughs> in fucking GTA. And I'm over here on Animal Crossing being like, this is neat. Yeah, but no, I'm living in the ghetto. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. You just reminded me of Bobby Womack. Across 110th Street. Anyway, uh, reboots. And if okay. you have any disputes, reboot and remake can at times get a little bit weird, but I think you can understand that I put way too much thought into each of these. Okay. Right but the what's your, oops, but, sorry. Okay. So tell everyone like what, what you consider, like what makes a reboot versus what makes a remake? Because remember, we have to like explain to people like it's, we don't understand, right? Well, I just didn't want to monologue so much. I was hoping that we would work through that together and see if you agree or dispute. Okay. Well, I'm just thinking this is an essay and you would just tell us at the beginning. But it's okay. So if you want to get into like the substance of it, as an attorney, I do issue rule analysis conclusion. So I've set forth the issue. Now I'm putting forth the rule, which was going to be the type of each. Then there's the analysis and there's the conclusion. So Okay. okay. Continue. I could also Sorry. do it as CREAC, which is conclusion rule analysis conclusion again which i actually prefer so if you want i can do that whatever makes you feel best i'm gonna creak it just for you aid because i know how important it is to have structure so i constitute a reboot where it goes beyond simply story points like probably the hardest one on this list for me was texas chainsaw massacre mm. the remake because like 
the story structure is similar. It's kind of the road trip. There's the hitchhiker. So I generally kind of put that in the remake category. Reason being, there wasn't a whole lot from the original. Forgive me, it's still one of my favorite movies, but there's not a whole lot of story there to recreate. So it feels like they kind of just filled it for a modern audience. But when it comes to like a reboot, you're talking about like a few story points that are either changed radically or done something with. A key element would be uh, Pet Cemetery. I think that the Pet Cemetery that just came out in 2019 is a reboot because it so drastically changes things when you don't have Gage be the little zombie boy. And, you know, whether it succeeds or fails kind of beside the point, but I think you can understand like it's the story points are the same. It's a kid. It's a kid as a zombie. It's a blah, 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 blah. But the way it happens is different. And albeit even that one ends way differently. That makes sense? Yeah. All right. So some of the reboots that I want to talk about. I consider Friday the 13th, 2009, Rob Zombie's Halloween, 13 Ghosts, The Blob, The Thing, The Fly, Invasion of Body Snatchers, Child's Play, Evil Dead 2013, Evil Dead 2, how about that, Piranha 3D, Dawn of the Dead, I Am Legend, Crazies, House of Wax, Black Christmas, Pet Cemetery, Haunting, Candyman, Leprechaun, Wes Craven's New Nightmare, Shin Godzilla, and I guess I put Flatliners 2017, which is actually kind of a sequel, but yeah. So those are my reboots, especially like Shin Godzilla, where it's like, hey, there, wouldn't it be weird if there was a giant lizard? Then wouldn't it be weird if its tail had a face and shot lasers? A little different. And then for remakes, forgive me. The top of this list is on this list because it's emblematic of the problem. Psycho, Nightmare on Elm Street, Let the Right One In, Carrie, Hills Have Eyes, The Omen, The Grudge, The Ring, My Bloody Valentine, Willard, Night of the Living Dead from 1990 and 2006. Red Dragon, Quarantine, Amityville Horror, Suspiria, Fright Night, Maniac, Nosferatu, Poltergeist, The Fog, Wicker Man, Prom Night, and The Hitcher. So shall we just get into it? Of mm -hmm. these lists, which do you think is your favorite reboot and which do you think is your favorite remake? Ooh. Well, you want to go first, date? I'd like to hear your cheese before you hear my cheese. I have a feeling I know it is, but she's going to lie and say it's not Rob Zombie because she wants to be cool. Well, okay, I left I left Rob Zombie out of this because, one, I know everyone hates him, and I'm going to talk a lot about him later this month. So uh, I'm, not, I'm not even going to get into Halloween. But my favorite remake is obviously Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the 2003. And I just wanted to make a little note because when I did my, my list, um, I did the years next to each other because I thought that was important. And Jake, I don't know what list I'm looking at in the drive because it's not divided. So I'm looking at like something completely off the wall. Um, so 2003 and then the old one's 1974. So I think it's really cool to kind of look at the the shifts and like how many years have passed because I feel like now when we're making, thank you. I feel like now when we're make, uh, remaking movies, they're happening them so quickly. Am I yeah. crazy? Okay. Well, and so, I think they're reactionary to each other. Like Texas yeah. Chainsaw 2003 did very well. I think it was like a $9 million budget and grossed over $100 million. So then they start dredging everything. And that's how My Bloody Valentine gets a remake, which is like, why? Like, yeah. that's the beauty of what I love about My Bloody Valentine. I've talked about it with Alan again. Uh, always a shout out because fucking great feedback. Uh, but my favorite slasher of all time is The Miner because I love that it's this beautiful little island where I don't have to make excuses for anything. It's not like, you know, Friday the 13th, probably my second favorite with Jason Voorhees, but then I have to make excuses. I have to be like, oh, well, you know, the fucking the one with green Jean Grey's, it's okay. Versus the yeah. one, it's just, there's nothing. And then naturally, of course, they had to kind of mar that with the kid from Supernatural. Ugh. Well, yeah. I agree. Um, but Texas Chainsaw Massacre remake, reboot, Evil Dead. The 2013? 2013. Yeah. I agree. Wholeheartedly agree with the, the actually, I think that's a fair analysis for both, if I'm honest. Okay. Doug, what about yourself? Oh, man, you hit the nail on the head, though. I was going to say the reboot, definitely Evil Dead, because I, I went into that already with the mentality of hating it. Yeah. <laughs> so when I saw it, I was kind of like, oh, you know, how can I hate this? I mean, I feel like Ash could just come right up in the last scene there. Like uh, they, they teased, remember? So I'm yeah. like, you know, it's it's kind of just another people going to the camp. Same one as before. I mean, that's what Evil Dead 2 basically is, right? Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, I really like that one a lot. But in terms of like the uh, the like a remake kind of I liked the Child's Play. Um, 
I'm going to call it a, a, a remake is because it's so drastically different, right? Well, is that I, what was, yeah. I was characterizing that one as a reboot. Reason yeah, being, a reboot? Okay, like a yeah. remake, I feel like would have to have like the character of like Brad Dorif, whose soul directly goes in. But just like you, I really liked that Child's Play, what I called a, a reboot. I love the vagueness, the ambiguity of the guy who commits suicide. Perhaps it's his soul in the doll, and that's why it doesn't work, or it's technology, or it's the cloud. Like There were a few things that were different. The story structure is kid gets killer doll, and then they just changed basically everything else. Yeah, and, and I watched it. Uh, so the thing is, they when they did the advertisements for it, they didn't show Chucky that much. They didn't really know what it was. It was like, oh, Mark Hamill's voice in Chucky. It was just really weird. And then uh, my me, Hyra, and uh, my friend Coker, we went to go see it, and we were like, we don't even know what to think of this movie. We go in, and it's like, this movie had no right to be this fun. Yeah. It, it's it's super camp. It reminded me a lot of like Sleepaway Camp 2. So yeah. I feel like, like that mm-hmm. type of atmosphere and not necessarily atmosphere but just like the mood it gives where it's it's like the f- kills are fun the killer you like yeah. um you like all the characters you kind of don't want uh, the neighbor to die but but she does spoiler alert wow. uh, i don't know it was just super fun and it had no right to be it had a great pace too because yeah like when you hear uh killer technology uh the cloud you're like oh fuck like that's what i was worried about i was just gonna be like fucking skynet watered down or something you know but then the way they presented it, I loved the ambiguity. Like, I thought that was way more interesting to me than a guy who gets shot in the belly putting his brain in a ghost, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. And so I thought that, that was really awesome. Um, now, in terms of remake, uh, there, mm-hmm. did, did you pull up the notes? Uh, I yeah. did, yeah. So I'm yeah. looking at it, and you know what I have to say? I'm gonna, I'm gonna be that emo hipster that sits in the corner and says, like, "Yeah, I like, I like grudge." I gotta say, Halloween two. I mean, uh, Rob Zombie's Halloween, but I like Halloween two specifically. Um, I, I don't know. I just think those movies. It, it, People are going to hate me. They're going to want to sacrifice me to the gods or whatever. But I actually prefer Rob Zombie's Halloween and Halloween two over the original. So. You know, honestly, I think that people are having a very, like, clean palette in their analysis towards Michael Myers. I've never really been a Michael Myers guy. Like, uh, Red Letter Media recently started doing a review of all of John Carpenter's works. And this guy, Rich Evans, was like, nope, like, Halloween isn't even in my top ten. And I thought, well, that's very refreshing that people are being that honest. Because, like, unless you give it the handicap of its historical significance, not that great. When you look at it historically as like a, a piece of film history, yeah, it's fucking amazing. But without it, you're just like, it's okay. Like, it's fine. It's serviceable. There's so many things that have come after it that are just like mind. Like, I would struggle to think that somebody could watch Halloween and then My Bloody Valentine and be like, you know what I really want? I want to watch Halloween again. Yeah, and, and I'll be totally honest. I ended up uh, watching it in 4K and the, the original Halloween. And I'm like, you know, it's, it's kind of boring. Um, and the thing is, I, I prefer, even when I was younger, I always preferred Halloween 2 over the original, because I think that's where, like, it really picks up. You know More what I mean? Like, for I just, sure. Yeah, definitely, because it's just, if you've seen it, you know all the beats, and I'm sure people are just sitting there waxing their carrot. Oh, and eight, I gotta say about the episode from last, or the one you guys were talking about where you watched Halloween 6, mm. people are gonna come attacking you if they haven't done so already. You said, I watched one that I, uh, Jack Sparrowed, and it was, uh, the one with the Rune Stones. That's the producer's cut, so it's not yeah. a TV cut. Um, and that's then the ar- what I'm saying. Yeah, and then the theatrical and cut was the one where he like bleeds green blood when he gets beat up by uh, Ant Man. Yeah, like the and that's but Jake was trying to tell me that it was uh, made for TV, and I'm like, no, 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 no. I, no. I googled it. <laughs> yeah, it's the producer's cut and then the theatrical cut, so a big difference. They'll come after you and. You know, well, slit your throat can you tell style. me plainly Please, that the producer's was cut fault. was never on television ever? I then don't I'm know. Still I never kind saw of it. Right. Maybe I it never, was. I never saw the the producer's cut until the, I'm 33 years old. I've been like I used to have the part six, the the theatrical release on VHS. I used to watch it all the time because one, it's totally 90s. Two, I love Paul Rudd. Three, it's the goriest besides Rob Zombie's Halloween, because the rest of them don't have a lot of gore, if you think about it. The, and, and if you listen to interviews with Mustafa Akkad, he, he specifically says that he doesn't like the gore, he likes the creepiness. So when they reshot it and they put all the gore in it, they obviously did that for audiences, but they don't really have 
after that, except for Rob Zombie, there's really not a lot of gore in any of the Halloween films. And I think it's because Halloween is supposed to be more atmosphere and it's supposed to be scarier. And people who do prefer the first one, like I love the first one, but it's very nostalgic for me. Exactly. When, when you're a kid and you're watching horror, that movie is fucking scary. When Michael gets up off the floor and those slow creepy movements and then he turns his head and he looks and she doesn't see it because she's got her back turned or like when she's in the closet those scenes are especially for a child because i probably watched when i was like 11 yeah especially for a kid imagine like this predator coming into your house and having the kids there adds another element of fear and he gets away that's the thing a lot of people kind of forget is it's the ambiguity of like what could be and so that's what, like, I think they kind of ruin, well, like I said, I've always say, like, they kind of ruin it with each one. I'll give it, like, I think that Halloween 1 and 2 are good, but then it kind of, everything involving Michael Myers, I won't say three ruins the other ones, because obviously it's tangential, yeah. but I think that the idea of a creepy dude is interesting and cool, and you're right, I think the atmosphere is what's really important, and I think a huge element of Halloween is it's a very accessible movie. It's a great gateway movie for a young aspiring horror fan because, you know, there's nothing over it that's going to make you feel queasy or like you need to go to church. And then that goddamn music is so good. And it's it's even better than, and forgive me if this offends anybody, it's better than The Exorcist because Tubular Bells is an amazing song. That portion of the song, which uh, oddly enough kind of mirrors Halloween, is played on like one part where the mom's walking across the street versus the theme in Halloween is like throughout the film and it builds and that ending and then it's done and you're like, oh, like you feel like that that breath of relief at the end. And then they do Ant-Man and Busta Rhymes versus Michael Myers. Well, again, I will defend those because I really do enjoy it. Those are fun. I feel like, the, my in my opinion, the weakest sequels are four and five. But I love Danielle Harris. So if she ever hears this, I don't want her to hate me. Don't so. you have a signed picture from her? You like met her and stuff? Yeah. I know. I you know, should but fucking Dan- apologize. Dan embarrassed me. He's like trying to flirt with her. And he's like, so how old were you? And you did. Don't tell mom the babysitter said. I'm like, Ugh. Old enough to party. <laughs> <laughs> oh, like, bye. <laughs> but anyway, so, yeah, with with the in terms of Halloween, I think if you're going to talk about the Rob Zombie ones, I think a lot of people like them. I enjoy them. Part two is a little weird, but oh, I uh, love part two. See, I consider those to be reboots because it takes yeah. thematic elements and sure they keep names, but <laughs> like, like the whole backstory and everything, it's as if you took like a story outline, you took like certain plot points took everything else out and then put your own shit in. And frankly, that's just not what I'm interested in. You know, like one criticism I'll give, I'll admit for my bloody Valentine is the end is like kind of shoehorned in where it's like, Oh, and this is the reason versus like Halloween where they're like adding and adding with Rob zombies. I just don't care about that. That's why it works so well with guys like Jason Voorhees or so well with the minor or so well, even with Freddy Krueger to an extent, you know? Yeah. For sure. For I think sure. we all forgot about that remake. Well, and that one also gives a backstory for Freddy Krueger. That exactly. I, the one thing I do like about that, though, is that it makes you wonder, did he really do that to those kids? And so I, th- I thought that that was interesting that they introduced that, even though we still find out that in the film he did. Um, because I feel like you always just assume that Freddy did all of these things based on what the parents said, but you really don't know what happened. Yeah, he wasn't and, convicted. That's a huge yeah, point. Exactly. And so I think it's more terrifying that the parents went and did these things because at the end of the day, you don't know. Like yep. that, that I thought that the remake did a good job is like, well, you don't know if he did those things. And so that that one I'll give it. There are a lot of horrible things. <laughs> Was that a remake or a reboot for you? I listed it as a remake because I think yeah. that they give enough story where it's an elaboration of that story. It's not its own thing because like for instance when you look at the relationship that michael myers has with his uh elder sister and everything there's nothing that indicates he's like abused and all that kind of stuff that's in the zombie one so i feel that's like adding story that's not embellishing story Mm -hmm. yeah and you know with rob zombie he tries to make everything very gritty and disgusting and like these people are just he he always has those elements in his film save for the lords of salem so it's like these are the characters that he knows and i don't know if this is how he lives his life because he's vegan and he's been (laughs) married to the same woman forever but i he just loves to talk about like these dirty people (laughs) like 
Okay. I, There's some credence which, there. I think that people are disgusting as a vegan who is married to the same person for a while. Yeah, it's fair. Well, no, like he's not. But I'm just saying I feel that it's just strange that he he he's so one way. But all of his characters that you can t- I, I feel that to write characters like these, you have to at least know them or to like have done these things at some point. He, I, especially with the devil's rejects, the way he fleshes things out. And so people want to hate on him, but he does. There are interesting things to the characters that he brings. I should say. I call him seriously. I think of him as like horror Quentin Tarantino. I think that like the devil's rejects is like his reservoir dog. I think it's rad. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting. The characters are fleshed out. Uh, the dynamics are cool. I like the way they reverse it. So you're cheering for people who are murderous bastards and then you're rooting against a cop. I think that it's really done well. The orchestration's good. The fact he almost gets the entirety of Freebird in is cool. There's a lot of like achievement through that. And it's not even like a nostalgia piece for me because that's one movie that like, I was watching alone. You know, I didn't have like parties with it or anything. And But there are movies where it's a complete miss. Like that's the way that Quentin Tarantino was like, I don't care. I fucking hated The Hateful Eight. I thought it was fucking awful. And they keep talking about like expanding it and making it a TV series for Netflix. I'm like, that literally sounds like hell to me. But, you know, I love Reservoir Dogs. So, it's, mm-hmm. you, keep, you know, you have to be selective now because there's so much shit. Like when I was listening to the Red Letter Media guys talk about uh, John Carpenter, there's so much stuff to watch now. I cannot fathom a fucking reason that you go back and watch Ghost of Mars unless you're simply trying to be a completionist and watch everything that John Carpenter's ever done. Because it is a bad movie. It is a negligible movie. It left no mark on the fucking zeitgeist of horror or action or sci-fi or whatever. And so I feel like that's the way you have to kind of be with some of these, too. Yeah. yeah, give it 30 years. Rob Zombie and Tarantino, they'll have their own college classes after them. You know what I mean? It's like the, exploring yep. the, the extensive history, like like a Kubrick class or something, you know? Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. Who would you rather see do a Star Trek film between Rob Zombie and Quentin Tarantino? Because if I'm not mistaken, both have at least talked about it in passing. Rob Zombie, I want to hear everyone say, you fucker, hey, yeah. fucker, hey, get down in yeah. Star Trek Bay, motherfucker. I know. Tootie he's gonna have fucking the, fruity. He's going to have Ken Forey. He's going to have Richard Brake. He's going to have Jeff Daniel Phillips. In fact, they're all here, I think, this weekend in, at a horror convention over at the Rosen Center. I'm like, oh, my God. I would just go just to meet all of them and get their autographs and take pictures. It'd be so fun. But it's literally the same people. So I, it's, well, well, I'm interested to see how he's going to do with the Munsters. So I guess the Munsters could be on this list if we think about it. Um. <sighs> Everybody's yeah, so can. angry about it. And I'm, I'm not just, I'm just not gonna see it. That's all. Like I, it, the Monsters is like sacrosanct to me. That was my fucking thing. That was my black and white show. Like I wasn't really into Adam's family except for yeah. Raul Julia and Angelica Houston. Like that one's fucking great. Christopher Lloyd kills it. And so like when you watch that and then you go back to the show, you're like, this is fine. You know, like the comics yeah. are really good. I'll give it that. But the Monsters, I loved everything. I even watched their shitty made for TV movies that they did that were in color and stuff. So I think I even watched, was it Jerry O'Connell was in the thing where he was supposed to be like Herman? And what the fuck was that? I don't know. Yeah, well, I think you're hitting the nail on the head with these remakes and reboots where people automatically shun them and hate them before they even see anything of them because it's the nostalgic base. So that's what a lot of these things are based off of. You know, it's like, oh, I, I, I can't do it because this is my nostalgia. But, you know, maybe, you know, a younger generation might see it and discover the old ones that's so i i used to hate on remakes and reboots and stuff like that before but now i realize it's like you know now because here's the thing texas chainsaw massacre um you know that with the remake or, or the reboot that's out whatever the people still go back to the original one even younger people so you know yeah. it's still out there because well, it gives you a like- vested interest to give the reason to invest in the film history i think that's a huge element because yeah. if i'm just like i said if I have all this fresh fucking content, if I have Squid Game coming in, why am I going to watch any of this other shit? You need the context. And so if you watch the new Halloween, you think it's even passable, well, then it gives you a reason to go back and watch the original or any of a number of these. Like, so, like, I keep saying that the Friday the 13th from 2009, people shit all over that movie. I'm sorry. That is a great movie to show someone who is finding it now because it gets to the fucking point. And if you like it, it's like a distillation of all the stuff you'll like, and it's done better than other ones. But here is the very short Cliff Notes version and go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
I think the only issue that I would have with it is that I do like the fact that uh, Pamela is the murderer in the first one. Yeah. However, the remake, and when I first saw it, I fell asleep. And I don't know why, but I... It was what when did they make the remake? It was 2009. 2009. So I'm pretty sure we were all drunk and we went to the movies because we were at a party. Went to the movies. And then so I fell going back to the admitting we have a problem. <laughs> hey, this was college, sir. College. Okay. This is when I had my most fun. I don't have fun anymore. I sit here and I talk to you guys. So this is my this is my entertainment. Uh, <laughs> well, You're the welcome. 2009 one, I'll admit with you as well, Aid, too. I, I, uh, I didn't. I didn't like it. Uh, that was back when I was still in high school. So my brother and I, I didn't have a car at the time. My brother and I, we, it was snowing in Ohio. And we, we drove about, or we took the bus 15 miles out to this movie theater that was showing it early. And we hated it. We were like, what the fuck is it? I mean, we, we, the sex scenes were pretty cool. But other than that, I'm just like, eh, it's just, but it's just too generic, I think. I don't know. Having rewatched it, however, a few years ago. Like, I've, I mean, I hadn't watched it since 2009. Literally a few years ago, I watched it again. I love it now. So there's a lot of movies that I didn't like when I initially saw them. But now that I've seen them, I really do like them now. So it's just like, I think your tastes change, too, as you get older. So when you're watching these and you're feeling nostalgic for the old one, you may love it. But then you see the new one. It's okay to like the remake or reboot people. You don't have to shit on it. You can be upset. Like, I was upset about Child's Play because we're still making Child's Plays. It makes no sense for you to take the rights of part one and do a whole that like that child's play movie could have been its own fucking movie, but we have to steal. I'm quoting Jake, the metadata. There you go. <laughs> right. Cause you Just need the IP the- because if you Google search it, child's play exists. Killer doll. 2019 doesn't. Yeah. So, I mean, honestly, it could have been a, a, a lot more fun for me had it not done that especially because i really did feel bad for the doll like oh my god they're being so mean to him <laughs> like but I, I don't know dan liked it so we'll give it that well <laughs> any movie that references texas chainsaw massacre part two as a learning lesson is a winner in my book so there you go and so uh going to the texas do you think that there's a bit like does it validate a reboot or a remake if it gets its own sequel for instance rob zombies halloween gets a sequel Technically, the two, uh, Texas Chainsaw from 2003 gets a prequel. There are a few of those. Uh, the Fly gets a sequel. Anything? Mm-hmm. Uh, the The Thing the gets a prequel in The Thing. Mm-hmm. I did like that prequel. Um, Mary Elizabeth hope- Winstead. That was a good one. I did hubba hubba. She's pretty in that one. Um, the Hills Have Eyes has part two, which because yeah. the the remake was so good, and that's the, the thing was too. Good. Yeah, that was a well, good one. Mm-hmm. And that was both with Wes Craven, The Hills Have Eyes, and Last House and Left. Those Both those remakes were so good. So much better. They brought so much to the story. You cared so much more about the characters than you did in the old ones. And the old ones were like more, I felt like, kind of Rob Zombie-esque. Like the old ones were very rapey and just mean-spirited and... Which like, last house on the left? You said especially last house on the left. Yeah, no, I watched oh that and God. I was like, I was like, ooh, I, uh, I'm like, it, it's not that it's bad. It's just it's 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 rapey and it's it's grimy, but it's also boring. Whereas the remake, you know, I, I you won't look at a garbage disposal the same way. No, I thought it was really good, you know. And then that one kid that was remorseful, they all did a good job. I liked that one a lot. You 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 felt it more for these people than you did in the old one because you know in the old one the parents get back the the girl dies and the parents get back at them but it's you know it was a it was a more of a commentary on the war back then so I understand where Wes Craven was coming from when he made that back then but to have the remake and do it um, so much better and just just for our audience I think we needed a remake for the last house and left yeah yeah that's fair. But you you haven't seen either of them. Nope. No. Not I, gonna do it. I know you won't watch them, which I don't. I don't. I I, I don't blame you. Um, I get it. Uh, and that's the same thing too with the Hills Have Eyes because there is rape in that in both of them as well. But yeah. in the remake, it's not as again it, they they kind of, not that they gloss over it. It happens, but it doesn't happen as overtly and in your face as Wes Craven had them happen. Yeah. In the old ones, which is strange because seventies, you didn't think that they would do that but then again they had all those exploitation films back then too so i don't know well and there's a a difference in implication versus being overt and that's another thing when i'm talking about the distillation of like a horror film 
there is implied, there's pacing, the, uh, other movies. And I feel like if you throw someone modernly into an older film, like I, I could totally understand why somebody would watch Texas Chainsaw 1974 from today and be like, it's just boring. You know, like when you think about it, there's like barely any gore at all in that movie. It's very, very minimal. So it's incredibly tamed by today's standards. You could show that unedited on regular TV and nobody would bat an eye. So when you don't have that historical context, so you kind of need 2003 to make it, you know, trigger someone in 2020. Yeah. Yeah, but see the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, they um one of our teachers in back when I was in film class and stuff, they they showed it because the thing is the last 15 minutes of it with Sally in the house, it they, they put like fear on film. It, yeah. You know, so like when it's the close-ups of the eyes and stuff, like there, there's not a movie I can really think that does that where it like shows how much and because you get anxiety. Like 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 watch watch the movie again with your smartwatch. Watch your heart rate go up. It just builds anxiety because it's like fear on. You feel you feel what Sally's feeling in those last 15 minutes. And and I think it's. I, yeah, because it's really disgusting. And if you watch the, there's a documentary where they talk to all the actors, including, um, I think Debbie Hooper is in it and they have Gunnar Hansen and they're talking about it. That scene, all that food on the table was actually rotting because it was so hot out yep. and it was disgusting. Like the whole thing is just nasty and you're sitting, she's sitting in there and they have her over that tub and they're hitting her over the head with the hammer and they're laughing and it's. It is really scary because Dan was like pissed off. He downloaded it. He's like, everyone keeps talking about this. I'm going to watch it. And I knew he was, I knew he was going to bitch in the first 20 minutes. Cause you know, exactly. I knew he was going to bitch and he did. But then when it gets to the end, he's sitting there like this. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I told you it's a fucked up movie. It's fucked up in different ways because the newer one is more in your face, a lot more gory. You care more over the characters. I feel like in the new one, like I really was upset when, when Kemper is, is killed first because we know that he's about to propose to Aaron. They find the ring later. I literally cry when I watch this movie, it breaks my heart. And so I feel that the, that the remake has more uh, elements where you actually care. In the old one, when the brother, and the wheelchair, what's his name? Do you remember his name? Oh, Fra Franklin. Uh, Franklin. <laughs> when Franklin gets killed, I'm like, oh, thank God. Seriously. Yeah, everyone's like, hey, yeah, get Franklin out of here. <laughs> but that, that's the thing. like, Getting somebody to watch a movie nowadays without looking at their phone or being distracted by a hundred other things, it's hard. And Doug, yeah. I'm with you, dude. I used to watch Texas Chainsaw alone every fucking Valentine's Day. I know you'd think that it'd be MBV. No, you do Texas Chainsaw, so you're not prototypical. But it's one of my all-time favorite movies. But for me, it's like it's like foreplay. You know, you're getting me in the mood, and then you make me climax. But there are a lot of people who aren't going to even let you start fondling their genitals with your cinema. You know, unless you've given some kind of putting something out at the very beginning. And that's a little frustrating with modern pacing. Yeah, well, that's exactly how it is now. It's like it's like those douche bros that go out and they basically rub the labia on the left for about two minutes to say, did you come, baby? Because I did. You know, that's, that's cinema now. <laughs> yep. Or people who slap the vagina. Why yeah. Why in the porn is people slapping vaginas? Well, that's what, what they see in porn. That's You take your dick and you just slap it against the clit. It's like, is that sexy? I don't know. <sighs> anyway. Uh, any other ones on the list that ring true to you guys as far as ones that you have? To, uh, one that I completely forgot about until I was doing my research was Red Dragon versus Manhunter. Manhunter is fucking bizarre. It becomes like a schlocky 80s detective movie. You know, the tooth fairies holding his shotgun with one hand. And it's just it's very interesting. And then Red Dragon is so fucking good. Like for however good. You think Silence of the Lambs is? I really love Red Dragon. Um, any other ones? Um, Ooh, well, yeah, Red Dragon. That was a man. That's you know what I'm waiting for. I'm waiting for one day for them to do a Motel Hell remake to see how that goes because that's another one that uh, they were talking about remaking it for the longest time. Yep. But, you know, I don't. Uh, the Blob. Okay, the Blob. That would wow. that would be a remake for sure. <laughs> I think right that's fair. I had it listed as reboot just because the character development's a little bit different. But if you put it in remake, that's a tough one because it even has the homeless guy. It's got all of those beats. But I think like the twist ending also kind of changes it. But yeah, well, it's better than the original, in my opinion. Hundred percent. Okay. Uh, but the original is fucking boring. And, and beware the blob is stupid. It's well, stupid. If we're gonna get a little controversial, let's talk a little bit about um the ambival horror then, because a lot of people 
Oh, fucking hate Jesus. that one. And and so I just want to first of all, and I did make a little list of reboots that suck and let the right one in can suck my fucking dick because Chloe Grace, Grace Moretz, aside from Amityville Hunter, everything she in, is in fucking sucks. Um, what about Kick-Ass? Kick-Ass sucks. No, because she's what? in it. I don't like her. Kick-Ass was fun. That's the one where you, a bunch of cops get killed the lawnmower. Uh, Kick-Ass is Or was okay. that Kick-Ass 2? I don't remember. Well, also, you get to have the two. banana splits by the Dickies. I mean, come on. Well, okay, but the end people who are like, okay, so the, 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 the remake with, well, they do have a, a naked Ryan Reynolds, but that's beside the point. Um, it is scary. And I think that people are upset with, with the, the remake because, you know, the, the old one is so nostalgic for them, but the old one can be considered boring. I do like the old one. I love the I love seventies horror. We know this. I just watched The Exorcist the other day, and I can sit through that movie and watch every single bit of it because I love listening to the characters and I love the build up and things like that nature. Um, but as far as like the the horror aspects, there's a lot of good jump scares. I know people hate that for some reason. People hate jump scares, and like, okay, I get it. But at the same time, like. A lot of your favorites have jump scares. They have jump scares in The Exorcist. They have jump scares in Halloween. They have them in uh, Friday the 13th. They have them in Nightmare on Elm Street. Like, what's your fucking problem if they have a jump scare? Who gives a shit? And then... I think I, it becomes the issue of the reliance on it. If you have story and jump scares, I'm with you. I think it's fine. But if you yeah. don't have anything scary except for a loud noise and somebody screaming, I really think it's just tiresome. Well, that's Bloomhouse. So mm-hmm. go ahead and talk shit about Bloomhouse and all the crap they come out with, right? Hey, they follow um, us on Instagram. Don't say an unkind word. Oh, oh, oh I'm sorry. Actually, well, I do yeah, like to the be country. honest, Ma, hey, Blumhouse, Ma is one of your best movies. Do more Ma. Yeah, Ma. Was okay, good. so you actually liked yeah. it because I wanted to see it, and then the reviews were dog ass, and I just because oh, no, it's, it's it's super. It's it's not it's not that it's weird. It's just so different, and I think people were like, "What? I want this to be a jump scare Blumhouse movie. What happened?" I'm like, no, this is Ma's great. Check it out. I think it's on so, Netflix. Ma is kind of like a reboot. Would you agree or disagree with me? A reboot of what, Heavens to Betsy's. What what's her name? I got like baby what? Jane vibes a little bit from that, but why why can I oh uh misery. That's what I'm like what? I'm like quoting her. Misery? Heavens to Betsy's. Dirty yeah. Birdie? No, it's because not she's, she's not Annie. Super crazy. Yeah. Like she's this, like she lures them in with her hospi- hospitality. I guess the wine's kicking in. Lures them in with her hospitality. <laughs> you don't piss on hospitality. She gets, them, she gets them to like trust them and they like rely on her. And then she like slowly starts to turn and morph into this, like that she's completely um, obsessed with, with the kids. What about people Annie's under the stairs? Upset. Is that a better analogy? Yeah, well, Ma, Ma was turning more into like a sex offender movie like later on when she, or like an underage because she was trying to get with those kids. Yeah, well, I don't think she was trying to get with them. She was, she like had it in her head that she was still a kid herself. Mm. And so much like Annie's like, Annie's delusions where she's like, part of the characters in the stories that he writes that's where i'm coming like i'm coming off that kind of I, oh, okay I feel like they I see, got she was idea. trying to go after the dad of those kids yeah okay that makes sense i see so. a little fatal attraction and what do you think of movies like swim fan speaking of fatal attraction <laughs> where it's like you just stole this fucking story i love swim fan it's good swim, it was a great fan. modernization and you know if i don't have to see a fake bunny put in a fake pot i'm fine no, but they doesn't she kill an animal in that one? Yeah, she shut doesn't. Up. Um, I, I think she does, right? Mm-hmm. Shut up. Oh, okay. But then we also <laughs> have um, the roommate, which is the remake of Single White Female. And instead of the dog being tossed out the window, she puts the cat in the dryer. So that upsets well any animal. But that one was really good too. But that one's like super teen, teeny bopper. So you guys probably didn't like that one. <laughs> That's what I can't do the teeny bopper stuff when they're like, oh my God, look at my, look at my uh, Tumblr. <laughs> Get the. <laughs> That's my boomer coming out. Uh, so. Yeah. If you guys as an audience have anything, please let us know. Um, I would love to know your thoughts. Now, here here is what we talked about as far as brainstorming goes. Adrian and I talked about this in the last episode. We're going to try it out. The three of us are going to brainstorm what we think would be the ideal reboot of something that hasn't been done before. And we're going to find the ways that we think that those slight shifts would work. 
we have a five minute time limit and go any movie that you think needs to have a reboot or could my personal opinion, I think uh, Dolly Dearest would need a oh, reboot. Shit, no. Yeah, because that's another one that I I like, but it's like it, it's like masturbating, and then you just come air, if that makes sense. Because at the end of it, it's like, no, I wanted more of this. Like you built it up so good, it's so creepy, and the last part you just blow up the fi- no, no. Like I want more, and it's a it's a killer doll movie that takes place in Mexico, which I think is even creepier, you know what I mean? I think we meet, need more movies like filmed in like, you know, Mexico, like just just the cold kind of creepy atmosphere. I'd really like to see that, you know, dolls possessed by the devil, multiple dolls in an abandoned factory cuz one thing that gets to me is like is like old factory uh, equipment that's been abandoned. I always think that's so creepy. So, if they do that now modernly, um, you know, I think that would be a huge thing and it'd bring people to watch the original Dolly Dearest too cuz you get the bitch that killed Selena in that movie. And uh, she gets killed. <laughs> I don't remember her name, but uh, yeah, every time I see her, I'm like, oh, it's the bitch that killed it's Selena. That <laughs> killed Selena. I know that's awful. Um, yeah, so no, that I'm happy to really keep working good. on it. I was gonna say, funny enough, uh, Deadly Friend, just because mm. I think that it, it's a fine premise, it's just done weird. And then Alice, Sweet Alice, because like oh. a fucking decade ago, they were talking about doing a remake that like never happened, and I was super into that fucking idea because it's a very weird movie. Uh, yeah, so let's let's stick with this. We have killer dolls. Uh, who's Adrian? Who's your celebrity casting? Who's going to voice this? The creepy doll. The creepy doll. Ooh, we have a lot of good ones. What about Jessica Chastain or something like that? Or we do we have to have a girl? We could have like a guy playing. Well, like Dolly Dearest it was a guy's voice. It's like yeah, it's like, time to play Jessica. She's in here with me. You know? Yeah, like Maybe. Zelda from Pet Cemetery. Boom. Mm-hmm. Get that yeah. fucking weird skeleton man. Yes, that would be so good. Um, but yeah, a plot like- twist pans out at the end of the film. And then you realize that the doll is a girl playing in a toy box. And you look down at the victims and you realize they were all dolls. That's the reboot. We did it. Really, I just came up with that hackneyed ending so that we could get to Doug's interview with Sam Hell. Doug, any cues you have to give before we give these people the succulent conversation you had with our friend? Oh, no. Well, I want to say you guys enjoy this interview with Sam Hell. Um, His new film, Let's Stop at the Morgue, is coming out soon, and the Indiegogo is live, and it's going until uh, Devil's Night, Halloween. So go ahead and give it... The movie's already shot. We just He just has to get some more money so he can uh, self-distribute himself, because this movie is a very graphic... Uh, extremely gory and just mean spirited film, and you know I'm I don't I didn't want to tell you how I get killed in this film, but it's it's brutal. I was like, whoa, yeah, that actually happened. So enjoy this interview. All right, three, two, one, and we're back from Doug. Doug, how do you think you did, Doug? I don't know. I said a lot of oohs and ums, and uh, <laughs> I, I'm a, like a much more uh, fatter Al Roker, I think. In, in oh terms my god, of there, so. <laughs> No, you're not. You're svelte, little hunky boy. And if I wanted to see your svelte, hunky boy body on, let's say, a television, how would I do that? Yes, so if you have a Roku, check out uh, B-Movie TV. I host Friday Night Action at 8 p.m. And uh, this month, uh, coming up, uh, we're doing all Halloween uh, shows. I got this film called Death Blood. Uh, Death Blood 4 from my buddy Chris DePredis, who was also in Don't Touch That Dial, so his film's going to be airing. Uh, during Friday Night Action, and uh, as as Jake said in the last episode, uh, donate more money to our Patreon. We need it, and I'll sell you pictures of my butthole on a calendar. Um, yeah. I don't know, and then I, I take nude photos in a really shitty looking uh, porta potty. So if you want some pictures like that, donate to our Patreon. We'll send you a Slasher's uh, memorabilia calendar or something. How much would it take for you to give yourself a dirty Sanchez? Uh, two bucks. Okay. Well, fuck. I have it. I'll Venmo <laughs> you right now. I also host a show on B-Movie TV, Saturday Night Terrors on Saturday Night's Fitting Enough. Aid, how else could people support us beyond Patreon? Oh, they can follow us on Instagram at Slashers Pod and Mutants from Beyond, as well as on Facebook at Slashers Podcast. And don't forget to buy some sweet merch. You can, well, you can't see it because it's green. (laughs) Slasherspod.redbubble.com. We've got a lot of cool new designs that Jake has up there. You guys have got to get on there and grab some cute stickers, t-shirts, hoodies, because sweater weather is coming up. So yay. 
Yeah, I, I have even more, and I'm happy to post those as soon as we get people buying the ones that we have. It's like one of those things like my wife criticizing me about the ROMs where she's like, you haven't played a game that you haven't took completion yet. And it's just like that. Until I have people adorning their titties with my art, I'm not going to give you more art. Somebody stop Dan because he, they loved the shirt. Oh, that makes me so happy. Yeah. The the Slashes slashes, of the Universe shirt. Yes, they loved it. And Dan took it upon himself. Oh, I do a podcast. Make sure you like and subscribe. Slashers podcast. And like, don't tell people that it's you on there. (laughs) I know what you should do. Like on the back of these shirts is like a QR code. Just have them scan them with their phone and go to the Slashers pod. Funny enough, that's what I plan to do for the uh, Saturday Night Terrors. Because like our numbers really don't go up. If if you found the actual show through Saturday Night Terrors, send me an email or a message with the password blah and i'll send you a patreon <laughs> bonus because i don't feel like there's a whole lot of you know carry over from there and so i wanted to make it as easy as possible because now people know what qr codes are because they have to use them to order food at restaurants mm-hmm. yeah well i i've noticed the uh, i feel like the b movie tv crowd too a lot of people like because they buy tvs with roku built in so at one time b movie tv was offered free like when you when you get it started so it's it's a lot of boomer generation on there i know we make a lot of boomer jokes but i feel like it's an older audience on there Oh, they're yeah. going to be indignant. They're going to want to talk to our manager, and I'm the manager, and I don't want to talk to them. But I had a pleasure talking with you guys. Stay tuned for the rest of Talktober. My name is Jake. For Doug and Adrian saying goodbye and good die. <laughs>